Okay, today we get to learn how to make images with mirrors. Really cool stuff. Everybody loves optics. All right, if you want to see a really good example of making images with mirrors, go look at the elusive dollar bill demonstration in the lobby of the Irene Science Center. There's a giant mirror and it projects this groovy image, almost like Star Wars hologram thing. You look at it, it's floating there in the air. You should go see that. All right, now, before we talk about how to make images with mirrors, we need to describe the assumptions that we're going to use. All right, first of all, as we discussed earlier, in this part of the optics section, we're going to be using the ray approximation. And to do that, we have to assume that the diameter of your lens or mirror is much larger than the wavelength of light. When that's true, we can do the ray approximation. Um, we'll discuss what happens if this isn't true later. We also are going to make the paraxial rays approximation. What does that mean? It means that the rays of light are all, are they're gonna be, a, we're not gonna consider rays of light that go off at weird angles. So if here is our mirror right here, we're only gonna s consider rays of light that stay kinda close to the middle of our mirror. We're gonna discuss in a minute this thing we call the optical axis, which is like a symmetry axis of our mirror we're going to assume that all of our rays of light stay kind of close to that axis. Now when we draw figures to figure out where images will form, we'll greatly exaggerate this dimension and it'll look like we're not doing the paraxial ray approximation, but we are. We're just kind of making this axis bigger. We're not drawing things to scale. All right? So with the paraxial ray approximation, uh, we can do much simpler calculations. If you don't assume a paraxial ray approximation, weird things happen. Spherical mirrors do not make images perfectly. And so in a real system, um, if you're not, if your system is not designed to only use fractal rays, which a lot of systems are, but if it's not, you get something known as aberrations, meaning your image doesn't focus exactly properly. Images get distorted, they get fuzzy. And uh, if you're designing a camera or a telescope or something, those are things you have to think about to make sure that you correct for those aberrations, make sure that things look good. But in the paraxial ray approximation, we don't have to worry about them. All right, we are also going to make the thin lens approximation when we talk about lenses next time. The thin lens approximation, just so you know, we're doing mirrors today, but we'll also kind of sprinkle in a little bit about lenses. But a real lens has two surfaces. The light bends at one surface, it bends at the other surface. We're just going to consider those two bends as one big bend and ignore the space that the light travels inside of the lens. That's the thin lens approximation. Okay, now when we make mirrors, images with lenses and mirrors, what we, the diagrams we tend to draw look like this. I've got some little arrow that represents my object. Rays of light come from it. They get bent by our lens or by our mirror, and they come back to a focus at some point, and we draw another arrow that represents our image. So what this is saying is if I have a little point that's emitting light, all of the light coming from that point gets redirected back to a point here so that if I put my eye down here and I look, it looks like all of that light's coming from here rather than where it originally came from, which is there. All right? Now, what does that have to do with making like an image of an actual thing? Well, if you will, imagine that we're taking a picture with this lens of Uncle Bill. And this point right here represents the tip of Uncle Bill's nose. All of the light that comes off of the tip of his nose will be redire redirected back to here so that if I look with my eye, it looks like the light coming from the tip of Uncle Bill's nose is right there. But if I draw another arrow right here to represent the top of his eyeglasses, well, I can draw more lines, and those lines will all come together uh, to focus right there. And so it looks like the light coming from the top of his glasses is actually coming from there. We do all of the points on Uncle Bill's face and we find an image and we say, ah, an image is formed of Uncle Bill. Now, a lot of times well, when we do calculations in this class, we'll typically assume that the subject we're looking at is, is very thin compared to the distances involved and then we can just kind of draw one arrow and figure out where that image forms. All right? With a mirror, same idea, right? I have some point, all of the light is brought back to a focus at some other point, it looks like that's where the tip of Uncle Bill's nose is, is right there. That's how the image is formed. All right, now, since we're doing the thin lens approximation and the paraxial ray approximation, we don't worry about the fact that our lens is thick or that our mirror is curved. I mean, the curvature just tells us how it bends 
But what we, when we do our drawings and our calculations, we're going to represent our mirrors and our lenses with a straight line, right? So instead of a lens, I'm going to draw a straight line. We're going to do all of our bends right there so we can do things more accurately, all right? So don't draw a big lens, just draw a line. I like to put little hashes, little arrowheads on my lines to remind me this is a converging lens. It bends out like this, so I kind of draw these lines that show me which way it bends and that reminds me, ah, this is a converging lens, one that focuses light rather than one that spreads light out. For a mirror, I do something similar. A converging mirror, though, is concave, not convex, so I draw arrows like this, and those arrowheads remind me that this is a concave mirror, a converging mirror that focuses light rather than dispersing light, spreading light out. Okay, now, some of the conventions and definitions that we use when we do imaging. First of all, we have this thing called the principal axis or the optical axis. It's a line drawn from plus infinity to minus infinity which passes through the center of the lens or mirror and is normal to the surface of the lens or mirror. So it's kind of like an axis of symmetry, all right? That's the principal axis, all right? And we draw our arrows for our object and our image starting at the principal axis, okay? We're going to use the variable p to represent the distance from the object to the lens or the mirror along the principal axis. So here's my object, here's my image, p is that distance right there. It's not the distance from here to the center of my lens or my mirror, it's the distance from my object to the mirror measured parallel to the optical axis. Now p is usually positive, alright? But p sometimes is negative. All right. When could I possibly have a negative distance between my object and my lens or my mirror? Well, consider this. Imagine instead of just having one lens, what if I had two lenses and I wanted to find the final image made by the whole system? Well, the way you do this is first you find the image made by the first lens and that becomes the object for the next lens. Then you find the image made by the next lens and there's your final image. Well, in this case, I've put this lens here closer to this lens than the image created by this lens. So this lens is making an image here, but the light never gets here. It's intercepted by this lens, right? But I can still pretend like this image here is the object for this mirror, but it's a virtual object. It's an object on the wrong side. So light's going this way, but my object is over here. So in this case, P would be negative. So when do you get negative P? It sometimes happens when you have multiple mirrors or multiple lenses, all right? Okay, so that distance right there would be negative P for the second lens, all right? For the first lens, this, is, this distance right here is P for the first lens, and then for the second lens, this image from the first lens becomes the object, and this distance right here is negative P because it's on the wrong side. If the image had formed over here, say right there, then this distance would be P for the second lens, and that would be positive. Okay, for a mirror, once again, Distance P is the distance from my object to the mirror surface measured parallel to the optical axis, or the principal axis. Q is the distance from the lens or mirror to the image formed, once again measured with a ruler which is parallel to the optical axis. All right, so that distance here, I've got a lens, here's my object, here's my image being formed by the lens, and there's Q. All right, Q is positive if the image is on the side of lens, the lens or the mirror where we expect the light to actually go. So in this case I have a lens, light goes through the lens and the image forms on the side that the light actually goes to so Q is positive in this case. In this case we say that the image is real so if Q is positive we say that it's a real image. A real image can be caught on a screen because the light actually comes to a focus there. So if I have a point of light right here I shine it out, it comes to a point, I can put a piece of paper there and I'll see a point. If this is Uncle Bill's face, the rays come, they come to a focus over here, I can put a piece of paper and I can actually capture an image of Uncle Bill's face. Or I can put a piece of film and capture a picture of Uncle Bill's face because Q is positive, which means we get a real image. All right? Here is what a real image looks like on a mirror, all right? So the, for a lens, the light naturally passes through. For a mirror, what does the light do? It reflects. So if the image forms over here where the light actually reflects, that means Q is positive, and my mirror has made a real image. So positive Q means that the image is on the side of the optic where the light actually goes, 
And if you have a positive Q, that means you have a real image. Negative Q. So here's a lens. Imagine this. I have an object here. The rays of light, I'm going through a diverging lens that actually spreads the light out, all right? So my rays come out like this. Whoops. Ah. My rays of light come out like this. Here we go. And if I put my eye right here and I look to see what's happening, it looks to me like these rays of light are coming from a point right there. So there is my image. But the light went through my lens. The light's going to this side of the lens, but the image is on this side of the lens. It's on the other side. So this distance right here is not Q. It's a negative Q. A negative Q means, so if Q is negative, if the mirror forms, or sorry, Q is negative if the image forms on the side of the lens or mirror where the light doesn't really go. In this case, we say the image is virtual. It's a virtual image because I can't catch it on a screen. It looks like the light is coming from a point right there, but it's not. It just looks like it. Whereas with the real image, right, if I put my eye over here, if I put my eye right here and look, it looks to me like the light's coming from that point rather than that point. But in a sense, it really is coming from that point, right? It comes to a focus. It originally came from here, then it focuses down here and comes from there. So in a real image, the light's really coming from that point. Whereas with a virtual image, it just looks like the light's coming from that point, but it doesn't really focus at that point, all right? It's on the wrong side of the lens. For a mirror, what does that look like? I shine my light here, the light bounces off of my mirror, and if I put my eye over here, put my eye here, and I look, it looks like the light is coming from a point back here behind the mirror. But if I put a piece of paper there, I will not capture an image. It's a virtual image. Q is negative. All right, so this distance right here is negative Q. All right, so that's what Q means. So P is the distance from the object to the mirror. Q is the distance from the image to the mirror. And Q is positive if the image is on the side of the lens of the mirror where the light actually goes, and it's negative if it's on the side where it doesn't go, on the opposite side, all right? So if Q is positive, I have a real image. I can put a piece of paper or a film or a CCD detector and capture that image, project that image. If it's virtual, I can't, but if I look through the optic, I can see the thing, um, all right? So. Once again, for a mirror, Q is positive if, if the object and the image are on the same side because the light reflects off of a mirror. Q is negative if the image is on the opposite side of the mirror from the object. For a lens, assuming P is positive, Q is negative if the object and the image are on the same side. Q is positive if the image is on the opposite side of the lens from the object. A more maybe consistent way to think about this is you look at this image with your eye. Q is positive if the image is on the same side of the optic as your eye and it's negative the other way, right? So for example, if I have a lens and I have an object here and I have an image here, where do I put my eye? I look through the lens at my object. If the image forms on the side with my eye, Q is positive. If it forms on the side away from my eye, it's negative. For a mirror, here's my mirror, let's make it a converging mirror, all right, I have some object, if that forms an image over here, where do I put my eye? I don't put my eye over here, I look at the reflection, so if I put my eye over here, look at the reflection, if the image forms on the same side of my eye, it's positive, if it forms on the other side for my eye, it's negative and it's a virtual image. So once again, negative Q is virtual image positive Q is real image and I can catch it, I can project it onto a piece of paper, onto a screen. All right, negative Q is when the image on opposite side from your eye. And positive Q is when the image on, is on the same side as your eye. All right, now, so once again, positive Q means you have a real image, negative Q means you have a virtual image, you can catch a real image on a piece of film, a CCD detector, a piece of paper, etc. Try catching the elusive dollar on a white piece of paper. Take a piece of paper, go up to the elusive dollar thing, look at it, then put a piece of paper there, get on the other side of the 
piece of paper and you will be able to see the dollar projected onto your paper. Fun experiment to do. Now, if you don't understand all this terminology, you should go back and review because we're going to move forward now. How are images formed by a flat mirror? Okay, well the idea is, once again, rays of light come out. A ray of light that's traveling parallel to the optical axis is going to reflect straight back. Well, a ray of light that's going off, so, you know, so here's, here you're looking at yourself and here's light coming off of the tip of your nose, right? Light scattering off the tip of your nose, if it goes up and hits the mirror at an angle away from the principle, not being parallel to the principal axis, well, the law of reflection holds right, and it's going to reflect symmetrically about the normal. If I send another ray of light up higher, it'll do the same thing, reflect symmetrically about the normal. It looks like all of these rays of light are coming from a point back here, and there is my image that forms with my flat mirror. So you look at yourself in the bathroom mirror. Bathroom mirror is a flat mirror. What do you see? You see this, all right? Is the image in a flat mirror real or virtual? Well, where do you put your eye? I'm going to put my eye over here on this side and look, and the image is on the opposite side from my eye, right? If I put a piece of paper behind the mirror, I cannot project, I will not catch an image on the piece of paper because the light doesn't actually go behind the mirror. All right, so Q is negative. So Q is negative, and the image is virtual. Now, under, make sure you understand these conventions and terminology before going on with this video. Okay, conventions for calculating images, where they form. All right, we have this thing called the lateral magnification, M. And M is just the image height divided by the object height. Right? If M is negative, then the image is inverted. And for a flat mirror, M is always 1. Let's look at our flat mirror again. All right? So this is the height of my object. I call this H. This is the height of my image. We'll call it H prime. So the magnification is the height of the image divided by the height of the object. And for a flat mirror, that's equal to 1. So if H prime is bigger, if the image is bigger than the object, then I'm going to get a magnification greater than 1. All right? If my image is upside down, then M will be negative. All right? So that's what M is all about. So for a flat mirror, M is always 1. F is the focal length of a mirror or lens. If F is positive, it's the distance from the mirror or lens that collimated light passing through it is focused to. Okay, I don't think that's good grammar, but let me explain that. What is collimated light? Collimated light is light where all of the rays travel parallel to each other. All right? So how do you get collimated light? Well, one way to do it is to put a point source so, so far away that the rays coming at you, they're coming out in all different directions, but it's so far away that all the rays you're interested in are traveling parallel to each other. So a point source at infinity will make collimated light, rays that are traveling parallel to one another. So if you have a lens or a mirror and F is positive, F tells you after your light reflects off of your mirror or passes through your lens, it'll come, these rays will focus down, all right, to a point, and that distance they focus to is one focal length, all right? So the focal length of a mirror lens. If F is negative, it turns out the collimated light won't focus. It'll bounce off of your mirror or go through your lens and bend away, all right? So that it appears as if it were diverging from a point, a distance negative F away. So for example, if I have a positive F mirror, that's like this one. I bring in my collimated rays of light. They all come to a focus to this point. And that distance from here to here, that's my focal length, all right, F. But if I have a diverging mirror, right, a convex mirror, I send in my collimated rays of light, and they're going to bounce away. But they look as if they were coming from a point back here. So this distance right here is not F, because F is negative for a diverging mirror. So this distance right there is negative F. From here to here is negative F. All right, now how do you find the focal length of a concave mirror? Imagine that, the, the, imagine that you have a spherical surface, all right? So I've got, this is, this is part of a sphere. Here's the center of the sphere right there, all right? And I, I make a sphere, hollow out the sphere, plate it with something shiny, and I shine light in. Where will collimated light focus? Well, I s draw a line from the center of my sphere out to the surface, right? There's my normal. 
So if I have rays of light that come in, a ray that travels right here in the center is going to bounce straight back. A ray that comes off to the side, it's going to reflect symmetrically about the normal, and all of my rays will come to a focus right here. How far is that? What's that distance? What's the focal length of a spherical mirror? It turns out that it's equal to r over 2, where r is the radius of curvature, it's the radius of our sphere. All right. To prove that, quickly, if we zoom in on our mirror, right, this is only valid in the paraxial ray approximation, meaning we only care about rays that hit really close to the center of our mirror, that our mirror is not very curvy. All right. So if I draw my normal, my line, from the center of my sphere out to the surface, my ray of light comes in, it reflects about that. All right. By symmetry, all right, let's look at this. This angle is theta. If this angle is theta, then this angle here has to be theta, right? That's the law of reflection. All right. But here I have a line that's parallel to the optical axis. So this ray right here, this line from the center of the mirror to the normal, it's intersecting a parallel line, two parallel lines, right? So if this angle is theta, that means that this angle is also theta. But if this angle is theta and this angle is theta, we've got an isosceles triangle, which means that this length right here is the same as that length right here, all right? In the limit of paraxial rays, where we bring this point down to the bottom, I basically have an isosceles triangle, which is a line that comes out here, a line that goes halfway back, a line that goes the rest of the way back. And we say, oh, that distance right there is r over 2, and that distance right there is r over 2, and that's also our focal length. So that's why a spherical mirror has a focal length, a converging spherical mirror, concave spherical mirror, has a focal length, which is the radius of curvature divided by 2. For a diverging mirror, a convex mirror, all right, the focal length is going to be negative, and it turns out you can do the same kind of trigonometry and show that your focal length is negative r over 2. Okay, now how do images form? They f how do we figure out where images form? Well, there's two ways we can do it. We can find the size and location of an image by drawing lines, all right? So here is our converging mirror. Imagine, here's my principal axis, and here's the radius of curvature. So my mirror is really a sphere, but we're not drawing it as a sphere. We're looking just at this line right here because we're considering only paraxial rays. But here's, right, we're exaggerating this, this dimension right here. So here's the radius of curvature. If that's the radius of curvature, where is one focal length from the mirror? It's going to be halfway in between. So there's my focal length, all right? Now imagine I've got an object sitting right here. Where will the image form? Well, there's some, the image, like, I'm going to send out rays in all different directions. They're going to bounce off of the mirror, and at some point they're all going to come back together. I just need to see where they come back together, all right? Well, there's four special rays that are easy to draw that will help us find this. The first one is, what happens if I draw a ray of light that goes right to the center of the mirror? All right, the law of reflection says, okay, my, my optical axis is normal to the mirror, right? So I'm just going to reflect symmetrically about the optical axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the object upside down. This is not the image. This is just something I'm drawing to help guide my drawing. All right, if I reflect symmetrically, this ray ought to pass right through there, okay? So there's one line I can draw. The line that hits the center of my mirror is going to come back just reflected symmetrically about the optical axis. So there's one ray. If I draw one more ray and find where they cross, that's where my image forms. What's another good ray to draw? Well, how about a ray of light that travels parallel to the optical axis? We know that collimated light, rays of light traveling parallel to the optical axis, what do they do? They bend so that they go through the focus. So if I did take a ruler, draw this line, find where it hits the mirror, and then draw a line that goes through the focus, that'll give me another ray. And it looks like these two meet over here, so that's where my image forms. So I have now, geometrically, just by drawing, I've found where the image will form and how big the image will be, right? But to check myself, instead of just doing two rays, I'm gonna, there's two more rays I can do, and I'll use them to check myself. The next one is one that travels through the focus. If a ray of light that's parallel gets bent through the focus, a ray of light that goes through the focus will be bent such that it comes out parallel. It will reflect out parallel. So boom, there's another ray. All right? A ray of light that goes through the center of the curvature, right? If I have a ray of light that goes from the center of a mirror, or of a sphere, out to the edge, it's going to bounce straight back. Right? Unfortunately, my object is right here. So if I send a ray of light that goes through the center of that, 
the center of curvature, it won't hit the mirror. Instead, let's imagine a ray of light that's traveling as if it were coming from the center of curvature. All right, so this ray right here, as far as the mirror is concerned, it came from the center of curvature, right? It doesn't know where it came from. It just knows it's traveling that direction. It will travel straight back, also crosses right here. And now I've got four rays all crossing together. I'm pretty sure I did this right. I found where the image forms and how big the image will be, all right? So our four special lines were a line to the center reflects symmetrically. That's this one right here, boom, boom. A line parallel to the optical axis will go through the focal point. So parallel, focal point. There's my focal point. A line through the focal point will come out parallel. So here's my line that goes through the focal point. It comes out parallel, right? And then a line to the center of curvature comes back to the center of curvature. So here's a line from the center of curvature. It goes back to the center of curvature. With those four lines, I can find out where my image forms and how big it will be. When we do lenses, we'll do something similar, except we won't talk about the center of curvature for a lens because they behave differently. We'll only have these three when we do lenses. All right. Now what about a diverging mirror? Imagine I have a mirror that's a, that if I send collimated light in, instead of coming to a focus, it bends as if it were coming from a focus. It bends away as if it were coming from a focus. Well, I can still draw my special line. So a line that hits the center is going to bend symmetrically, right? A line that's going parallel is going to bend as if it came from the focus. This is just a guideline to help me draw that. We'll take it away now. So this beam will come in and bend like this. A beam that's going as if it were going to the focus, it's going to come out parallel. So I hit right there, it'll come out parallel. Once again, that was a guide, so let's just get rid of it. So my three lines do this. I've got a fourth line, which is a ray that goes towards the center of curvature. will come straight back. We'll get rid of this guide. And now we see I've got my four rays, and this is how they come out. They don't cross anywhere. I do not get a real image. But it looks as if they are coming from a point right here. So I extend these lines back, and that's where my virtual image will form. This distance right here is P. This distance right here is negative Q, because the image is on the wrong side. It's not on the side with your eye. So Q is negative, and I get a virtual image. So that is how you figure out where an image forms, and how big it will be, and whether it's upright, or, as we saw previously, ah, or if it's inverted, as this image was. All right, By drawing lines with either a converging or diverging mirror, I was able to figure out where an image would form, how big it is, and whether it is upright or inverted. Inverted would mean negative magnification. Whereas here, with my virtual image, I get an image over here, my virtual image, it's upright, so my magnification would be positive. But it looks like it will be less than 1 for this drawing. OK, so here I have a virtual image, negative Q, positive M, but smaller than 1. All right, now how would you find an equation? I mean, we're drawing all these lines here. Could we use these lines to actually come up with an equation where we, with, where we could just calculate exactly without having to draw things and measure them carefully? Like you calculate where an image would form and how big it will be, all right? Well, if we look at just these two rays, the one that goes to the center and then the one that's parallel and then gets reflected back to the focus, these rays make some triangles for us, all right? So if I take this line right here, here's a triangle, and then here's a triangle. These triangles share this distance right here, Q. They share a side Q, all right? Um, well, actually, no, they don't. <laughs> this triangle right here has a side length Q, whereas this one has a length Q minus F, all right? This distance right here is minus H prime, height of my image, right? Negative the height of my image. And now using all of these similar, you know, knowing all these things, I can use trigonometry and put things together and come up with equations. I do some algebra, and this is what you end up with. So the point was, just by doing some, some trigonometry, we're able to find this equation, that 1 over f is equal to 1 over p plus 1 over q. So if you know the focal length of your lens or your mirror, this, by the way, this works for lenses as well as mirrors. It works for converging and diverging mirrors as well as converging and diverging lenses. So this is a good equation to know. But if I know the focal length of my lens or my e mirror, and I know how far away the object is, I can then quickly calculate using this how far away the image will be from the mirror or the lens. 
And depending on whether Q is positive or negative, I'll know what side of the mirror the lens it forms on, whether the image is virtual or real. All right, now, when I form my image, when I do my drawing, I can figure out how tall the image is going to be and whether it's inverted or not, all right? But I can also calculate that, and I only need one ray to look at that, all right? Because I know my image is going to be somewhere, formed somewhere along this ray, right? This ray that reflects about the center of my mirror. Well, I have similar triangles, right? That triangle, that triangle, and this triangle. They're all similar triangles, which tells me then that the magnification, the ratio of this height to this height, is just going to be negative Q divided by P. Because this distance right here is Q, this distance is P. So there it is. Magnification is just negative Q divided by P. There you've got it. So, cool thing you note here, if P is positive, assuming P is positive, that means if Q is positive, I get a real image. A real image is going to be inverted. A virtual image is not going to be inverted. If Q is negative, it'll cancel that negative sign. And there you have it. There is how you image with mirrors. Next time, imaging with lenses.